everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Texas Balance of State COC general meeting. It's February, in case you didn't know. Um, I'm still surprised by that fact. This is Cameron Fowler. I'm the COC director here at the Texas Homeless Network. I'm going to go ahead and let the other staff who are in the room with us today introduce themselves. Sophia Cheka, Systems Change Coordinator. Kristen Wojcicka, Vista Resource Development. Craig Blaze Fierro, COC's Program Assistant. Mary Ricklick, COC Manager. Jason Phillips, Vista Program Manager. Lindsay Marsh, Data Coordinator. And I believe Mary is going to start us off today. Oh, yeah, the map. Thank you. The map. This so I did pull this one a little bit early, Chad. I know you're up in Lubbock. I missed your job. I'm sorry, guy. <laughs> you just, I was running a little bit early today. But we do have good spread today. I pulled it. We're at 82 registered. We have almost 60 on the line right now. So we've got a few latecomers coming in. But it's good representation for the balance of state. Keep them coming. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Mary, the CLC manager. Um, we have a spotlight at the beginning of every COC general meeting where we like to put a spotlight on a specific program, agency, coalition, community, innovation, good news, anything that we think that we want to um, share with the entire COC membership from somewhere around the COC. So if you want to spotlight something in the future, let me know by emailing me at mary at thn.org. Um, the spotlight that we had scheduled for today was uh, ending veteran homelessness in Northeast Texas, and that was going to be presented by Randall Webster of Community Health Corps, who is also one of our COC board members. Um, however, he is um, something came up, and he is now not able to do that with us today. Uh, so I'm sorry to say that we're not going to hear him talk, but uh, we do want to hear from Caitlin Baer, our program's coordinator, who is in Denver, or actually in the airport on the way back from Denver. Um, she just uh, participated in an SSVF launch event. So Caitlin, would you like to update us on what happened at your launch event? Sure. Hi everyone, this is Caitlin Bear. I'm the Balance of State Programs Coordinator. I hope you all can all hear me okay because I am in the airport currently. Um, I uh, just got back from uh, the SSVF, or Supportive Services for Veteran Families, launch event, um, which is an event that happens once a year whenever the new grant cycles go out for the Supportive Services for Veteran Families grants. We had a lot of Balance of State grantees who were there, including Randall Webster, which is why he was unable to join us today, unfortunately. Our schedules didn't align, so we could both be sitting here in the terminal together. Um, so he was unable to make it today. Um, but I did want to let you guys know what is in general happening in SSVF land and in the realm of ending veteran homelessness. Um, some of you may know, some of you may not know, depending on how familiar you, familiar you are with the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness's um, criteria and benchmarks for ending veteran homelessness. Um, but they just came out with a new revision this past Thursday, and so it's worth taking a look at on the USICH website, which is USICH.gov. Um, the new revision has added a couple of new definitions, as well as incorporated some other guidance that they had issued um, into one place. So it's a lot more convenient, and I think it's a lot more readable and a lot more helpful, and I'd recommend that anyone who's interested in getting federal recognition for their community um, for having ended veteran homelessness take a look at that. And I also wanted to highlight that at this uh, launch event, there was a lot of talk about master lists and making sure that communities that are interested in ending veteran homelessness have a really well-developed master list and that um, it incorporates all of the needed data elements um, to be able to prove to the federal partners that you've ended veteran homelessness. Um, so I would be more than happy to get with anyone um, who's interested in starting that process. Um, my email address is uh, Caitlin, which is spelled C-A-I-T-L-I-N. So Caitlin at THN.org. And if Craig will be kind enough to put that in the chat box as well, um, you'll have that there. I see a question from Veronica Thomas here. One 
wondering what the website was again. It is USICH, and I don't know if it's .org or .gov. Maybe someone in the room can help me. Um, but if you Google United States Interagency Council on Homelessness or USICH, it should be the very first hit on Google. Caitlin, it is .gov. .gov. All right, great. All right, and that's um, all that I've got for the realm of ending veteran homelessness and some key points that I wanted to make everyone aware of from the SSVF launch event. All right, thanks, Caitlin. Have a safe trip back. Thank you. All right, um, I'm going to move on to COC current priority projects, but I also had a staffing announcement I wanted to share, and some of you may have already received an email about this, but for those of you who haven't, our data coordinator, Lindsay Marsh, after six years, six plus almost, um, is going to be leaving THN. She's taken a position at TDHCA and will continue her work in homeless services. So wanted to let you all know that. We are definitely going to miss her around here. We're glad she's going to continue working in the field, and we will probably be working with her in her new role at TDHCA. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to Lindsay for an update on the Pitt and Hick. Hi, everyone. Uh, Stephanie and Texoma, I hope you made it on. We were just talking, so I was late. Uh, point in time, if you have not done that, I need that as soon as possible. I know that the uh, official due date is the 17th of February, uh, as I detailed in my email to you all, or most of you, earlier this week. It would really help with the transition period if you could get that to me as soon as possible. Um, a housing inventory, every uh, housing um, I'm so sorry, uh, gosh. Uh, every housing project in, in the balance of state, regardless of funding, needs to provide us with their housing inventory every year. This is the number of beds for households with children, the number of beds for uh, households without children, and then we also need to know how many of those beds were filled on the night of January 26th. A lot of you have been sending those in. It's a crazy response, so thank you very much for everyone who has gotten that to me. If you have not gotten that to me, I need to know immediately. If you have not seen the housing inventory worksheet, if you are unfamiliar with this, I need to know. Please send me an email. I will get it to you, but I do need the housing inventory uh, last week. So please get that to me today or tomorrow. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to let me know, and it would be great if you could get all of your questions to me ever by next Wednesday. <laughs> all questions ever. Did y'all get that? Um, it looks like we have a question. And I can't see. It's intended, Hick intended for shelters. Jennifer, could you go into a little bit more detail with your question? I'm actually here. I don't know. Well, there's two of these. So any program that was using HMIS or uses HMIS for your shelter or transitional housing program, your data should have already been submitted via HMIS. Um, any program in the balance of state needs to submit a HIC. So if you have questions, please contact Lindsay. And like Lindsay said, your HIC was due um, last week, and we really need it. And with our losing Lindsay, we especially need it as quickly as possible so we can get this data entered and get it back to you. Um, there will more than likely be a little delay on HIC and PIT data um, because of staffing transition. So. If you have questions, please um, contact Lindsay. John Cooper, I see your question, and I will respond to you. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions about the housing inventory count or the point in time count while we still have Lindsay in the room? OK. Mary is going to update us on travel. 
All right, so people from our team have gone to some places around the COC in the past month. Um, Sophia and Caitlin actually were in a place not in our COC. They went to San Antonio to help with their strategic planning session that CSH did with them. And Sophia and Caitlin and actually Eric all participated in what CSH called a charrette um, to help with their planning on for their whole COC. So that was exciting that our team members got invited to um, be on panels related to that strategic planning for a different COC. Within our own COC, uh, in mid-January, Cameron, Sophia, and Caitlin went to Denton for planning and SSVF specific planning and meetings. Um, in late January, Cameron went to Abilene for planning and for a pit count. Uh, specifically, Abilene Hope Haven Shelter opened this that week. This week. Oh, this week. Yeah. Oh. So we're looking forward to hearing how that's going. I believe Monday was day one. John Cooper can correct me on that. And it was my first trip to Abilene, and I just wanted to thank everyone again for their hospitality. It was really great to be there and to help you all with your point in time count, to get to work with the coalition and with Abilene Hope Haven and with our VISTA member, Laura, out in Abilene. So thank you all again for the work you're doing. And also wanted to shout out to Abilene. They were the first uh, community to get all of their point in time materials to us. So they will be the first to get their report. Oh. Yay. Um, Another awesome thing about Abilene is they were the people who sent me to um, SSVF, the West Central Texas Regional Foundation out there. So a big shout out to them as well. Nice. Shout out all over. Um, also, on the note of pit count, while Cameron was working with the Abilene folks on that, Caitlin and I were in New Braunfels helping them with their point in time count meeting some of the people there and some of the helpers and some of the people needing housing. And that was also in late January while all of you were doing your point count, point time counts as well. Um, much more recently, as in this week, Cameron, Caitlin, Jesus, and Victoria were all in Laredo for ending veteran homelessness planning and HMIS training. So, got some exciting things going on there as well. And as we already heard, Caitlin was in Denver for the past couple of days um, for an SSVF launch with all of our SSVF grantees and others from around the country. Finally, um, we have some upcoming training, or sorry, travel. Cameron, Caitlin, and I will be attending the National Alliance to End Homelessness Family and Youth Conference in Houston. February 22nd through 24th. And we talked to you all a little bit about this at the last meeting and encouraged um, anyone who was able to attend, since it was not too far from most of us in the rest of the state, uh, if you could possibly make it. Um, it's a great opportunity to participate in some trainings and workshops from a nationally recognized and renowned organization addressing homelessness. All right, and so actually, um, we'd like to know if any of you are planning to attend that conference in Houston on February 22nd through the 24th. If you would type in whether you're planning to go, give us an idea of who else will be there. Yeah, and that's it for the travel update. So we're excited that we've been able to go out much more frequently in these past few months than we were able to last year. Um, in part because we've gotten more COC planning funding from HUD um, with the recognition that, uh, one, we are a very large COC, but also across the board, HUD recognizes the, recognizes the importance of the planning type work that we all do and that the COC lead agencies in particular do to try to make the COC really work as well as possible. So we're grateful for that. and excited to um, spend time in your communities. If you want members of our team to come to your community, please reach out to one of us and let us know and what specific topics that would be most helpful for you. Thanks, Mary. 
Um, we're going to move on. So yesterday, I was actually traveling back from Lubbock, but staff here were able to attend a debrief from HUD on the COC competition this year. Um, I know you all have heard a lot about this from us, and we'll keep hearing it because we're still really excited about all our renewals being funded and our reallocations and our new projects. But we finally received our application score from HUD and wanted to share that with you all. So what we've put up uh, for you all to view now is just a comparison from 2015 to 2016. And you'll notice we had a significant increase in improvement this year. Um, yes, fantastic. I'm not going to go through every single one of these with you all, but we had a 26 point improvement in our application score. And if you look at the highest score for any COC, this competition, that was 187.75, and we came in at 175.75. So we, I mean, we knew we did well. We knew y'all did well. We didn't think, or I didn't think we did quite this well. Um, so just it was really nice to get this from HUD um, yesterday and to see all of the hard work that you all put in and we all put in this past year are really paying off. Um, again, we're really pleased in the improvement, really pleased to see how close we were to the highest score um, and that we were you know, well above the median and as well as the weighted mean score. And that's actually how we ended up getting additional funding this year above and beyond our annual renewal demand. So we know it was not an easy uh, competition process. It will be probably a little more challenging this year. Um, you know, we, with working with you all and with our board and staff here, um, and you all on the ground with your projects did an immense amount of work last year and just want to keep moving in that direction. We can see here how moving towards housing first and low barrier and really working on our data quality and our COC governance structure is really helped us um, with our performance. Um, oh, thanks, Sophia. So a 42% increase in our score. That's pretty amazing. Dang. So you all give yourselves a hand for this. Um, and I'll say again, you know, staff really just took it to a whole nother level here at THN. And um, it, showed, it showed in the application. And we're hoping to do it again this next year. Um, as always, you know, we don't know when things are going to get released. We heard possibly early summer. We'll see what happens. Um, that would be great. We're ready to get started. Maybe not this month, but in early summer. Um, and just want to let you all know, you know, yeah, the work that has been put in has been fantastic, but it's going to keep coming. And Sophia is going to talk about one of those big projects that we've got under our belts to complete in this next year a little later on today, but wanted to share this good news with you all and wanted you to give yourselves a hand for this work as well, so thank you. Thank you also to Cameron for leading the ship. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to move on to announcements. And as always, if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box or raise your hand. We are checking them. And Jesus is now going to give us an update on HMIS. OK. I'm going to try to my best. Hello, everybody. Um, I wanted to say thank you to everybody that attended our first HMIS webinar uh, last, uh, the end of last month. Uh, that was the first one. We're kicking up a new season of HMIS webinars. Uh, we had 87 attendees, and I think that was uh, the highest. Um, I mean, we can still have more. Uh, we had 112 people that registered, and we had 87 uh, people that were attending live. I know that some of you actually bunkered uh, together in, in certain organizations, you guys register separately and then uh, attend in groups, which is great. Uh, but let us know so we can count uh, every, every one that attended the webinar. 
Um, we heard a lot of questions, which is the best thing um, that uh, happens when you're live because then you got you can participate. Um, we got a lot of questions. We got a lot of suggestions too. I think one of the suggestions was uh, let us know in advance if it's something that is going to affect our program um, or if it's going to be uh, geared towards other kind of programs that are not uh, what is that? Uh, that is not for us. Um, so they can switch or they can choose not to attend. We will try to do that. That's why we haven't sent the invitations yet because we're going to try. Um, if there's information that everybody's going to cover, we're going to make sure that we'll invite everyone. If there's information that is going to affect only PATH programs, for example, or RIPE programs or COC, ESG, we will tell you in advance, hey, you can't miss this one. Um, so what we have for the HMIS calendar right now is that we're going to have the HMIS webinar on the last Thursday of every month. You will you notice if you were there that this past one in January we didn't have it on the last Thursday because actually that was point in time day. So we decided to not uh, trouble anyone that was doing point in time. So we we had it on the 31st. But in reality, moving forward is going to be the last Thursday of every month. Uh, which means that the next one is going to be the 23rd and the time that everybody chose, well, you guys chose this one, I just gave you the options, um, it's 1 to 2.30. So put it in your calendar. Last Thursday, uh, 1 to 2.30, it's going to be the HMIS webinar and we hope to see you guys there. Another thing that before I, I move uh, forward uh, here is I want to make sure that Everything that we cover there is uh, for your benefit. So if you have any questions or if you have any topics that you would like us to uh, try or discuss during our, our webinar, please send me an email way in advance so we can prepare properly. Um, but because we want to make sure that every, every piece of information that you're getting from the webinar is actually going to benefit you and your program, it'll be best if you tell me, hey, you know what? It'll be nice if we learn about this and then we can bring that into our agenda that is constantly growing because there's already stuff that we're going to be uh, talk t talking to you about there, but we're, there's always space uh, to open for, for other suggestions. So I guess that's it. that's it. I want to make sure that everybody knows that they can reach to us, which you guys already know that anyways. and. Um, there was something else that I wanted to say, but I guess it's escaping right now. We'll return, maybe. <laughs> we'll return. Thank you very much for attending, and we hope to see you there again. Thanks, Jesus. So if you're using HMIS and didn't get an invitation to the webinar somehow, please um, contact the HMIS help desk and let them know that so we can make sure you're on the list. And I'm going to move on to just a couple COC grantee announcements. Um, COC grantees, you've probably seen several updates from HUD in the last two weeks or so. Um, I hope you are all reading those thoroughly because they're important. And one of them had to do with your APRs, your annual performance reports. Um, we've been suspecting this was coming for quite some time, but HUD is moving to a different system and APRs will no longer be submitted in eSNAPs effective April 1st. They are going to be transitioning to a new system called SAGE. Um, we had a, I got to see a little bit of it last week. Um, it looks like it's going to be really great. We always have high hopes for these things. I also know that there will likely be bugs that need to be worked out. So, and we'll be getting in touch with you all, but I just wanted to give you a heads up now. If you have an APR that can be submitted before April, um, so say maybe you have until the end of April or part of May, but you can submit in March, do it in March. Um, there's going to be problems with it. It's a new system. It's inevitable. And, you know, we want, will absolutely support you all and work through those with you, but we want to avoid using it initially if, if we can help it. So, again, if you have an APR 
that you can submit before April 1st, we're going to highly, highly recommend that you do that. We'll be contacting our grantees via email about that. In addition to that, we're going to be sending out some information on the LOCK system. This is the system, for those of you who don't know, and I know we're throwing around acronyms again, like alphabet soup. Um, this is a system that COC grantees use to get their reimbursements from HUD. And just want to remind you all that passwords to the system cannot be shared among different people in your agency. So it's similar to HMIS. One license, one login, one user. Um, HUD has new software that is allowing them to track people who are logging in. And I'm not tech savvy, I'm not going to start trying to talk to you all about IP addresses. I just know that they have software they didn't have before. And we've had some programs across the country and in Texas, not in our COC, um, get in some pretty rough waters with HUD over the past month or two over sharing locks passwords. So strongly, strongly advise you to not do that. And I'm sure none of you are, but just wanted to throw this tip out there. Again, we'll be sending more information about it. Um, also wanted to let you all know that some of our projects are new projects and reallocated. So also new. Um, as well as renewals, have started receiving their award letters from HUD for the 2016 competition. This is a good sign. This means maybe we'll be, I mean, we'll, we will be seeing grants executed, but this is the first step. So we were pleased to see those. We got ours. Um, I know one of our new, our new PSH projects in Lubbock, Carpenter's Church received yeah. theirs. So and just a reminder to you grantees, please do let us know when you get that award letter. Um, from HUD. So those are just a couple announcements for COC grantees and I'm going to pass it off to Mary to talk to you all about ESG. All right. Yes, and I too have heard from a number of you who are already um, working on your ESG grant application. This is the one um, that we refer to as state ESG because the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, or TDHCA, is the recipient of that funding from the federal government. And so they make it available via competition to any eligible entity across the state. So as part of that application process, um, we as the COC lead agency at THN have a role to play with you we are going to help complete your attachment A form. And that's a form that TDHCA requires as part of the application, which um, certifies your, the applicants, continuum of care participation and coordination. So everyone in the Texas Balance of State COC, which is our COC, you will be applying directly to TDHCA for this funding. Some COCs have chosen a different way of doing things and are working with TDHCA where applicants will apply to the COC lead agency, but in our case, you will still apply to TDHCA. But again, our role in it as a COC lead agency is that we are going to talk with you about what project you're proposing so that we have a better understanding of what it is and we want to make sure that it's aligning with our COC goals. And we're going to talk with you about um, performance targets and that sort of thing to make sure that you're aiming high and um, going to develop a really successful program or project, I guess they call it. So we have drafted or sorry, finalized now. I've been saying drafted for a few weeks, but it is finalized now our process for how you request the attachment A form from us. So you'll see um, on near the bottom of that first page, the process, by March 1st, which is a few weeks away, you as applicants should submit the following items to me at THN. And one is the document checklist, which we'll see in a moment. And the rest of the items are all pieces of the actual application that you will be submitting to TDHCA. So we are trying to streamline what we're asking of you 
and we're only asking you for materials that you already have to complete for TDHCA. And therefore, we'll get all our information from that rather than you filling out a different form or um, in the past two years, we've had to fill out a WUFU survey. This year, we're just asking for copies of your actual application, pieces of it, not the entire application. Uh, then from March 7th through 17th, uh, you and I will be, the applicants and I will be setting up appointments to talk over the phone more about your project. Again, we'll go through all those application pieces that look at uh, not only performance, but how um, your partners are going to be interacting with each other. We'll make sure that you are in a good position to start using HMIS or a comparable database if you're not already doing that. Um, we'll talk about your uh, participation in our COC general meetings over the past year, and all those other questions that Attachment A is asking us to discuss. Then um, by the 24th of March, everyone should have their signed Attachment A form back from us. We will have concluded all the consultations, we will have signed your form and gotten it back to you, so then you would still have at least a week to submit your application to TDHCA, and those are due on March 31st. So we think we've um, drafted a realistic timeline. Um, however, we know, you know different communities and different applicants are at different stages of things. So if um, you need somewhat of a different timeline, or for example, sometimes people want to submit early, so you can request that we try to get you on the schedule for an early consultation rather than later in the process. Um, please feel free to do that. All right, on the next page of the document, uh, just some background information. Certainly this is very specific information from the NOFA and the application guide that TDHCA has available, so you should certainly read all of that information in detail. Um, that will give you the most information about how to fill out your application and what all the details are. But a few that we specifically wanted to point out are that um, the budgets and performance measure targets should be proposed for two years, 2017 and 2018. Because in this competition, TDHCA is making two-year awards, awards for 2017 and for 2018. So in one competition, but it will be an award that will have money for two years. And you'll have two different contracts, though, a 2017 contract and a 2018 contract. But this is really important because this is a change. And um, I'm not sure if they're going to have a competition in 2018 or if all the funding that is awarded in this competition, their next competition will be for 2019. I hope so. I think that's the case. But I, I shouldn't be so certain about that. I will look into that. Um, but I know for sure the awards that are coming in for this competition will be for 2017 and 2018. So TDHCA um, allocates funding to each COC in the state um, based on a formula that they have created. Uh, and as a result of that formula, the funding allocation for our COC is a little over $3 million. And single applicants which are applicants that are proposing a project and applying for funding on their own, you can request no less than $100,000 per year or $200,000 for two years, up to a maximum of $150,000 per year or $300,000 for two years. However, if you are a collaborative applicant, meaning you have a lead agency and at least one partner agency, um, your request is still no less than $100,000 per year or $200,000 for two years, but your maximum is $150,000 per year times the number of partners in the application, with a maximum request of $600,000 per year or $1.2 million for two years. So those of you who have been collaborative applicants in the past, you know that uh, when you partner with agencies, uh, which is what TDHCA incentivizes in their scoring criteria, it can help provide a more comprehensive project design 
and more partners in the community being involved for doing what their specific expertise is. So for example, one partner might do the street outreach component and a different partner might run the emergency shelter component. And um, because you are collaborati collaborating and proposing a comprehensive project, that allows your collaborative application to request more funding. All right, also COCs and ESG recipients and subrecipients, which anybody awarded in this competition would be considered an ESG subrecipient of TDHCA, who is the recipient. But um, the subrecipients are required to work with COCs in several ways. They must enter data on all persons served and all activities provided under ESG in our HMIS system called Client Track or for victim services providers, a comparable database. And I know many of you use OSINOM. Wait, Osnium. <laughs> Not OSINOM, sorry, OSINOM Center. I get that mixed up all the time. Osnium. ESG subrecipients must also participate in our COC's coordinated entry system. And you will hear more from Sophia about that in a minute. And ESG subrecipients must ensure that their project's written standards comply with and include our COC's written standards for coordinated entry and for rapid rehousing. So we will fill you in more on that once you become a subrecipient. And then we listed some resources there for more information on um, the ESG program itself, the ESG interim rule, the COC interim rule, which um, has responsibilities for COCs, and then a special document that HUD created where they identify the coordination and collaboration requirements for COCs and con plan jurisdictions, in this case for um, state ESG. There is our lovely COC map. Anybody who is in a county in orange, if you're applying for these funds, you will talk with us at THN to get your attachment A form. On the next page, we have outlined how we're going to determine the answers that we'll give on the attachment A form. So in the left column, we have the exact question listed that's on the attachment A form. And in the right column, we explain how we will determine which answer we give. We want to try to be as transparent as possible so it's no surprise to anyone when we answer a certain way. So for example, the first question, indicate the frequency of the organization's participation in COC general meetings from January 1st through December 31st, 2016. Our explanation is that we held eight general meetings in 2016. Um, we did call them two different names throughout the year. They, and they were called the Representative Planning Group, or RPG, meeting from January through September. And from October through present, we are now calling them COC general meetings. But we'll be using attendance records from both those sets of meetings to determine whether anyone from the applicant agencies had participated in the meetings. So that tells you how we will answer that question. And we've done that for all the questions on the form. So hopefully you understand how we come to our answer. And then finally on the fourth page is a document checklist that we're providing because we thought it might be helpful because we're asking for a number of pieces of your application. We listed them each separately with a checkbox in front of them to make sure that you can see easily what we're asking for and you can put a check mark that you have submitted it. So we want you to submit this document checklist and each of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pieces of the application. For those of you who have seen it so far, you'll recognize there are three main parts to the application itself. So part one, part two, and part three. And then each of those parts has a number of tabs within that workbook. We don't need to see all of it. We just need some of them, but you are welcome to submit the entire workbook to us if that's easier for you. We will only be looking at these particular worksheets that are listed 
But if you, again, want to submit the entire workbook because that's easier, that's fine. And then the bottom set of boxes is all related to attachment A. And we just want to make sure you realize that every lead agency and every partner will need to have an attachment A form submitted to us. That was um, quite confusing for some folks last year. So we will, in fact, be completing an attachment A form Again, for every single applicant, every collaborative applicant lead agency, and every collaborative applicant partner. So we've given you individual checkboxes there. Uh, so you can know that you've submitted everything we're asking for. So that is our process in a nutshell. You are hearing it first at this meeting, but we will be sending it in an email soon, or maybe posting it on our website. Probably both. Or probably both. So um, certainly, though, um, feel free to call me or email me with any questions. Um, my information is there at the bottom of page three. But again, it's mary at thn.org. And again, I will be the one doing all the consultations with you on your application um, pieces that we're looking at so that we can get you your attachment A forms and you can submit them as part of your application to TDHCA. Thanks, Mary. Um, I would just say again, I know that looked like a lot, but we really did make an effort to only have you all send us what you're already completing for TDHCA because we know that's, that's enough. Um, and again, feel free to send your whole applications, and the only parts we're going to look at are the ones listed. Also, um, there's definitely, as Mary said, a focus on collaborations, but they did reduce the minimum amount this year. And that was one of the comments that THN put when uh, TDHCA was accepting public comments, just to give an opportunity to some smaller programs and programs in rural areas that may not have partners to collaborate with. Um, and I also just wanted to point out, and Mary may be able to correct me on language, but I know that match for ESG is frightening um, for Agencies, and I know we had a lot of agencies that didn't apply last year just because of the match requirements. There is a match waiver that can be requested uh, from TDHCA, and at least last we spoke to them, they've never actually received a waiver request, so it's in place for a reason. And, of course, if you can get the match, get the match, but if that's really something that is a challenge for you or your community, don't let that be the reason you don't apply for these funds if they're needed. Um, so just wanted to remind everyone of that. And um, Mary, we're back to you on Homelessness Awareness Day at the Capitol. Okay. So um, THN, as you see by this lovely logo, we are still celebrating our 25th year with um, Impact 25. One of our big events coming up is Homelessness Awareness Day, which is this month, February 28th, so just a couple of weeks away, at the State Capitol. Um, it's going to be from 11 to 4, and it's an opportunity for us to all go to the Capitol on the same day for an afternoon of meetings with our legislators and their staff about homelessness in Texas. Um, and as our Jennifer's write-up here says, we'll provide the tools, you provide the power. And um, she is hosting a webinar on Wednesday, February 22nd to review the day's events, what to bring, what to talk about, um, to provide a time for questions and answers about the event. Um, just anything that you might need to do and we need to do in order to prepare for that day to make it a really meaningful and impactful day of talking with our legislators about homelessness in our own communities. So um, yeah, the idea is that you would bring information specific to your area and you would meet with your legislators and give them more information about what it means to be addressing homelessness in your communities. Um, and she says here, if you're not able to make it to Austin, you can still participate by calling your representatives. So that's a great option for those of you who may not be able to travel here or have anyone from your community travel to Austin that day. Um, you could still have a phone calling time 
within your agencies and within your larger communities. So any way that we can get the word out to our legislators on that same day would help us have um, leave a bigger impression. So uh, that announcement is on our Facebook page. We also sent out a notice in the e-news on January 20th. So check it out if you have questions. Um, Jennifer? Mm -hmm. Again? Jennifer Paulson at jennifer at thn.org. So we're excited about that. We think it's going to be a really um, important day for us to make our voices heard and maybe reach out to some people who haven't uh, heard a lot about homelessness already. A good way to educate them and inform them about the important work that we're all doing. Thanks, Mary. Um, I was actually going to plug our Facebook page, so I'm glad that you did while I'm in here looking at Kristen and Craig's beautiful faces. Um, if you're not following us <laughs> on social media, you're hurting my feelings. <laughs> um, you should check us out. Um, they've been doing a really great job with our Facebook page and Twitter and, and, Twitter YouTube. and YouTube and Instagram. Like we're yeah. all over. They're like a rip like a millennial. Yeah. <laughs> all over it like a millennial. Um, all our young staff members. <laughs> So just wanted to, yeah, remind you all that that exists and check it out. And I think with Homelessness Awareness Day, it's, I mean, it's important every year, but it's, I think, especially um, important this year. We know there are some cuts definitely coming down on the state level, and we are, you know, stay tuned on federal and other um, funding cuts. So if you all can, again, join us in Austin and or do anything from home, um, we need your support and we all need to support each other um, as we're working in homelessness in the dogs of state. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> again? No. Mary Day. All right. Um, so we wanted to show you some new resources that the US ICH has released. And Caitlin mentioned one of these earlier as she was talking. Um, but that group is the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. And they are a 19-member grouping of federal agencies who are all trying to work together to coordinate their funding and programming and guidelines with um, what they're individually doing to address homelessness, coming together as a group to make a big impact. Many of you have probably heard of one of their biggest accomplishments in 2010. They released the first federal strategic plan to end homelessness called Opening Doors. So I can hardly believe it, but we're going on seven years now since that plan was released. Yeah. Um, it has four main goals to end veteran homelessness, chronic, to end chronic homelessness, to end family homelessness, and to end youth homelessness, all in the effort to ultimately end all homelessness. So they released in January a sort of progress report on opening doors and how it's been going over the past seven years. It is called Driving Progress Toward Ending Homelessness in America and the Work Ahead. I wanted to give you some highlights from that. <clears throat> yeah, Craig's going to pull it up here. It's at the bottom. Um, since 2010, all of us working together across the country have reduced homelessness 14% nationwide which may not sound like a lot, but if you know doing this work is really challenging to make even a little bit of a dent in reducing homelessness, so 14% is nothing to sneeze at. Um, the next data point, however, is incredible. 47% reduction in ending veteran homelessness, including a 56% drop in unsheltered homelessness. And we know that that has been a big focus of the federal government, um, including funding over the past few years, is to really show a dramatic decrease in, address, in ending 
or in the number of veterans experiencing homelessness. So clearly, we have seen uh, major progress in that arena. We've also seen a 27% reduction in ending chronic homelessness. So also um, really significant numbers and a 23% reduction in ending family homelessness, including a 65% drop in unsheltered homelessness among family households. Oh, unsheltered. So 65% drop in unsheltered homelessness among family households. That's just incredible. So um, I'm glad they started with this progress information because I think it is really encouraging to read that and helps us feel inspired like, okay, all of this work that we're doing all day every day really is making a difference for the individuals and families that we're affecting. Um, so then this brief just kind of goes through each of the topics you'll see there under our progress in the veteran homelessness and the chart showing the numbers going down. There's also a link there to the criteria and benchmarks. Um, I will, well, okay, we can go there. <laughs> Just to note that um, Caitlin told us a moment ago, those were released a couple of years ago, but last year, uh, sorry, last week, they were updated. So if you haven't read the newest version of the criteria and benchmarks for ending veteran homelessness, those are now available on their website. Hot off the presses. Um, then it goes on to talk about ending, or sorry, let me see, just a few things on ending veteran homelessness. They specifically point out the importance of the HUD-VASH program, and that HUD-VA supportive housing program, which is a joint effort between HUD and the VA, to provide permanent supportive housing for veterans. And also um, the project, or program that Caitlin told us about, SSBF, which is supportive services for veteran families. Um, so key components of those two are coordinated entry and housing first. So uh, those who are leading the way on some best practices for ending homelessness, and we are learning from those and making great progress in ending veteran homelessness. And again, the idea is that everything we're doing and learning and setting up now in terms of a focused effort on veterans is going to help us address other subpopulations in the future even more strongly. Uh, let's move on to ending chronic homelessness. Again, some of these same interventions that are working, permanent supportive housing, housing first, um, working with assertive outreach and engagement to try to help people get into housing, and there is a link there as well to the criteria and benchmarks for ending chronic homelessness. Those did come out almost a year ago, uh, but they are still valid and certainly worth looking into in terms of how you can determine whether your agency or your community is uh, making progress on ending chronic homelessness. The next paragraph talks a little bit about helping families get out of homeless situations. And they don't mention any interventions specifically there, but we will talk about it in another document, the criteria and benchmarks um, in a little bit fuller detail in just a moment, because those were just released uh, in January. And then finally, ending youth homelessness. Um, you know that HUD has had an emphasis on that in recent years with the youth count for 2016 point in time count and the recently announced awards for the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program. And in January, they also released some criteria and benchmarks for ending youth homelessness. I um, wanted to point out the essential strategies that have driven some of this progress. They outline and describe each one there. Setting ambitious goals and asking leaders to publicly commit to them has generated significant momentum on a problem once believed to be unsolvable. And they point out the mayor's challenge to end veteran homelessness where almost 900 elected officials have signed on. Defining what it means to end homelessness is providing government and communities alike clear goalposts in order to focus their efforts and resources. So again, helping us know how to measure the progress that we're making. 
Um, and it says that we're fundamentally rethinking how we can best structure and administer programs and services. So a lot of that systems change type work that we're talking about there. Shifting to housing first approaches that ensures federal, state, and local dollars all go further to improve outcomes for people and for communities. Um, specifically, we're talking about housing first approaches, lowering barriers, so those same things that um, Cameron mentioned earlier that we get scored on in our COC application. So obviously you can tell all of these um, topics we're talking about today really are interrelated. Federal agencies are working in closer partnerships with states and local communities. And they especially point out SSI and SSDI for people with disabilities. And just to note that our VISTA program um, does have opportunities where communities can have a VISTA member who focuses specifically on SOAR, which is a way to help people apply for SSI and SSDI that is streamlined and often um, more quick and more effective than doing it without using SOAR. All right, so they give us an outlook for the work ahead and some recommendations. What do we need to continue doing? Increase the supply of affordable and supportive housing. No surprise to many of us who work in this arena, that's probably one of the biggest challenges that most of our communities face. Enhancing connections to employment and independence so that people are more able to um, afford their housing and stay housed without our assistance. Continuing to strengthen our data collection and analysis. Reducing the damaging cycle between criminal justice system involvement and homelessness. Ensuring all communities can provide real access to opportunity and advancement. And advancement. I wanted to point out they um, specifically mentioned rural communities there and American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Um, we certainly have a number of rural communities in our COC, so um, it's exciting to see that there are, um, you know, specifically pointed out that um, working in rural communities is important. And that it says this must include providing more assistance to rural communities. So we'll see if anything concrete comes out of that. Maintaining partnerships at all levels of government and building lasting responses that will sustain our success. So, great progress report on what we've done so far. Um, pointing out some things that have worked and also things that need to, we'll need to continue working on. I wanted to specifically again mention that the criteria and benchmarks for ending family homelessness and ending youth homelessness were just released by USICH in January. And I took the language from the website, I'll just read it here. Collaboratively with communities across America, USICH and our federal partners developed a national vision for what it means to end homelessness, ensuring it is rare, brief, and non-recurring. The criteria and benchmarks ensure all communities are working towards that goal. Criteria and benchmarks work together to provide a complete picture of a community's response to homelessness. Criteria represent the essential elements of a community's response while benchmarks serve as measurements that a community can use to evaluate its overall effectiveness. In developing the criteria and benchmarks, USICH and federal partners sought input and guidance from key stakeholders, including local service providers, continuums of care, national partner organizations, advocates, and people with lived experiences of homelessness. These criteria and benchmarks represent our best thinking at this time and will be further refined over time. So that applies to all four sets of these benchmarks. And as you saw just last week, um, USICH updated their criteria and benchmarks for ending veteran homelessness. So they are staying abreast of these criteria and benchmarks. I will say that the family and youth ones that were released last month are not as thorough as the criteria and benchmarks for chronic homelessness and veteran homelessness. But on the webpage it says that supporting tools will be published soon. So which one are you on there, family? Yeah, what, will you open the document itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, 
you'll see these are formatted very similarly, but we'll look at the family one. Again, it just goes over the purpose of the criteria and the benchmarks, gets into the specific criteria, and they're almost identical between these two documents. So uh, number one is the community identifies all families experiencing homelessness. With the youth one, it says the community identifies all youth that are experiencing homelessness. Um, the second one is the community uses prevention and diversion strategies whenever possible and otherwise provides immediate access to low barrier crisis housing and services to any family or youth who needs and wants it. Now some of the details under each of these are slightly different, but the overall uh, strategy is the same. Third, the community uses a coordinated entry process to effectively link all youth or families to housing and services solutions that are tailored to their needs. Fourth, the community acts with urgency to swiftly assist youth to move into permanent or non-time limited housing options with appropriate services and supports for, for families. And fifth, the community has resources, plans, and system capacity to continue to prevent and, end late, and quickly end future experiences of homelessness. Um, for families, they specifically talk about workforce systems, TANF agencies, behavioral health, child care, so that um, the community is able to provide non-housing crisis response options, including emergency financial assistance, safety services, transportation, legal services, and others. For youth, they specifically point out um, preventing or diverting youth from experiencing homelessness through substantial partnerships with schools, including post-secondary educational institutions, the child welfare and justice systems, employment, physical and mental health, and other youth-serving programs. They talk some about um, connecting youth experiencing homelessness to appropriate and choice-driven crisis housing and services connecting pregnant and parenting youth to Head Start and child care centers, and again, swiftly moving youth into permanent or non-time limited housing options. Then the benchmarks, again, are the same overall goal for both with different details underneath. But the first one is there are few families or youth experiencing homelessness at any given time. So we want to make sure that we're helping people not fall into homeless situations so that there are only very few at any given time. And that youth or families experiencing homelessness, again, are swiftly connected to safe and affordable housing options and to permanent housing options. Um, so just wanted to point out those new criteria and benchmarks to you and know that um, they have said more tools are to come. Your communities can start using these by um, reviewing them at your local homeless coalition meetings, for example. You can also use them within your own projects or within your own agencies to just kind of see how are you doing on ending homelessness for these specific subpopulations. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, and I think, like Mary said, this isn't, you know, really kind of new information about how to move forward in any homelessness and systems change. And I think, as you all heard, and also nothing new, that coordinated entry um, is going to be a big piece of that. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Sophia. Hi, y'all. This is Sophia, the Systems Change Coordinator. My responsibility is to help communities implement coordinated entry. And I really quickly want to say something about the criteria and benchmarks. Essentially, they're assigning metrics to determine if you've developed a housing crisis response system that can prevent homelessness from happening, or, or if it should happen, you can quickly put people back into housing. So that's that's what that that's what the criteria and benchmark are looking at. Um, I'm here today, obviously, to talk about coordinated entry. Anytime you hear my name come up, usually that's what I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, and 
I hope it's very few of you. Coordinated entry is the coordinated and strategic process by which you're connecting people experiencing a housing crisis to housing resources. Um, it is not the housing crisis response system. It is a piece of your housing crisis response system. Um, I have exciting news. <laughs> so on January 23rd, HUD finally dropped the new notice regarding coordinated entry. It's a notice CPD 1701, which Craig has put up. I have been waiting for this for two years, <laughs> and it could not have come at a better time because I am in the middle of working on all of our coordinated entry materials, so our written standards and our toolkits, uh, our toolkit. Um, so I'm really, thank God for HUD in this instance. Um, <laughs> There's nothing surprising in the notice. Um, it's pretty consistent uh, with the coordinated entry policy brief that was released in early 2015. So again, when I say that it, it, I've been waiting for two years, I've been waiting for two years. Um, essentially what it is is more guidance regarding items that must be included in our written standards. Um, the biggest change, so again, not a lot of changes, um, but the pretty, there was a pretty big change or requirement in it in that we need to develop prioritization requirements for ESG funded homelessness prevention resources. And that is something that we haven't seen in any other guidance provided by HUD. Um, so we're going to be having some conversations with TDHCA and also with um, subrecipients and recipients of um, ESG funding to talk about how uh, the balance of state should set their prioritization requirements. Um, we really want to emphasize that communities that receive ESG and or COC funding um, will be prioritized for help in implementing coordinated entry. Since it is a requirement of your funding, you, we will be helping you first and the most. Um, and then Depending on the COC and or the ESG funded projects in your community, um, we're really expecting them to be active participants and leaders in the process to set up coordinated entry in their communities. Again, because this is a mandate of their funding, it makes sense for you guys to drive the train. Um, the materials that I alluded to earlier, so our written standards and our toolkit will be released soon. I feel like I, I feel like cut at this point where I'm always saying that. It <laughs> is coming um, within the next month. Um, I also want to point out that the notice also set a um, deadline, which uh, it was scary at first because in the first email came, that came out, they said July 4th of this year which uh, sent us all into a panic because that's not far off. Um, and then the next day they released an update saying that all of the standards uh, that were written about in the notice must be set up by January 23rd of 2018. So our deadline for the implementation of local coordinated entry systems in the balance of state is also January 23rd, 2018. So you guys have a little less than a year, which is ample time. It really is. It doesn't sound like it, but it is. It shouldn't be taking four years to analyze your system and setting it up. It, you can do it. Uh, Longview, for example, we had a conversation in one day, and they set it up for veterans. So it's possible. Um, again, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> we expect COC and or ESG funded projects and communities to lead the way. So you guys must be active participants in it. I also highly encourage you guys to try to get your local government officials involved. So I'm going to give a shout out to Denton. Um, they've been involving the mayor and county commissioners and city councilmen in this discussion. We actually went up and had a meeting with them, um, as Mary told y'all, last month, which went really great. And um, there's a reason why all the materials tell you to include your mayor, because your mayor gets stuff done, and also your city is usually a very large funder in your community and the people that control the purse strings. Yeah, anyway. Um, also, um, just about the deadline, January 23rd, excuse me, January 23rd, 2018, we assume 
So again, assume, we all know what that means, um, that the FY 2018 NOFA or notification of funding availability for the C of C program will have more questions about coordinated entry than we've had before, to be honest. The last couple of years, it's been like two or three questions, but nothing really significant. But now that there is guidance, we expect that that year there will be more questions about it and every year thereafter, um, which will also mean that for our competition for projects, there will be more questions about coordinated entry in your local communities and how you're participating in that. Um, so there's a lot going on, which is really exciting. I've been waiting for this for a long time. I've said that, I know, three times already, but I've been waiting for this for a long time. I've been telling everybody that things are coming, things are coming, and I, it's I'm excited. Yeah, I'm really, really excited. Um, I'm excited to have some meat behind what HUD has always intended. Um, yeah, so that's it for me. If anybody has any questions, Sophia, S-O-P-H-I-A, at T-H-N dot org. And I love to talk about anything system change or coordinated entry related, so holla. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, we have a date for coordinated entry, y'all. Oh, so I can see all this. Um, Are these webinars you did for grantees and non-grantees on the they are on our YouTube um, for the <laughs> accountability webinar. I forgot to press record, of course. So that one is not up there, but all the other ones are. Okay. So there are webinars on the YouTube channel that uh, Sophia did on coordinated entry for communities overall and specifically for COC grants. And I also want to say that don't restrict your information gathering to just those resources. Mm -hmm. There's a plethora of information available about coordinated entry and, oh look, I have my own little, mm -hmm. um, and to some point we, we need to depend more on communities and also on grantees on educating themselves. Um, on these requirements, if you receive funding and this is a requirement of that funding, to be a good steward of that funding, you need to know what you have to do. So you need to know the ins and outs of coordinated entry, maybe not as much as I do, but you need to at least get the basic concepts and all that kind of stuff. So if you want information about what resources to look at, because I've read a lot of them, um, let me know. When yes. do you think your toolkit will be available? In the next month. I'm never again going to assign <laughs> a date anymore. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, soon. In the next month, if, if we're spending the night here like we did during competition. <laughs> Three days on a yoga mat. <laughs> um, and yeah, like Sophia said, y'all, I mean, none of this should be new unless you're a new grantee and weren't really involved with us before. He became one. Um, I know THN was working on and talking about this well before my arrival last year, and we've been putting resources out. Um, and yes, you can contact Sophia. Also, I mean, if you just go to USICH or NAH, there's no lack of resources on coordinated entry. And we're really excited to get this toolkit out to you all. Um, I think it's going to be really helpful and we really tried to break it down to a step-by-step -step. and we're not saying it's easy but we know you all can do it and we know everyone can do it um, by the deadline so that's going to be a lot of what you all are hearing from us over the next year and since you since we're talking about the toolkit it, like really nebulous just so you guys know the goal is that it'll guide you through all the systems change or like all the difficult conversations that you need to have in order to make a court, like the end goal is, right, having these difficult conversations so that we develop this system that'll help us streamline access for people experiencing a crisis. So it does include talking to your other providers about lowering their barriers to entry and adopting housing first and do you have eligibility requirements or policies and procedures in your written standards that could potentially exclude people from receiving assistance. Um, so you have to have those conversations. I know that they're difficult. I know that change is hard. But in order to have a coordinated entry system that works for everybody, 
you have you have to have these conversations and it needs to happen at a system wide wide level but also at each individual agency yeah i watched a webinar earlier today i was talking about it, it was a rapid rehousing webinar and it was virginia that it incorporated ce to their communities they said the work was hard they stretched their funds by 58 yeah. percent just by doing that one little system not even including every other toolkit that we've provided today just by ce allowed them to extend their profits put more people in housing, and basically save their funding at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's what it is. It's to help communities also with resource allocation. Oh, go Holly, she watched it too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, if y'all <laughs> trailing, yeah. if y'all aren't watching those NAEH webinars, the Rapid Housing series, you should because they're fantastic. And they're also putting out um, D several different tools and there's a blog and a web sign-up sheet for the newsletter. Yeah, and there's a webinar, I don't know if it was already or it will be coming, um, specific to rapid rehousing for people with zero income. I believe it's on Valentine's it's, Day. Yeah, that one's next week. If you go to THN's website, we do list all the webinars that we're watching on the community calendar so you can find them there too if you're not just doing web searches so we do have that one posted get yourself a little nice little marshmallow covered chuck or chocolate covered marshmallow and enjoy that webinar <laughs> um okay michelle's got a question michelle yates has asked if there's a hud mandate to tell shelters to lower their barriers because some require ID and social security. Uh, no, there's not a HUD mandate. I mean, there's a HUD mandate to lower barriers. They don't get as specific as IDs and social security cards, but I would say um, any shelters that's requiring an ID or social security card is going to have a lot of people out on the streets in their community for a very long time. Um, yeah, obtaining ID and social security cards is probably one of the biggest hurdles to obtaining income, therefore housing, and that's really something that should be worked on at a case management level. It should not be keeping anyone out of emergency shelter. So if you all or anyone wants to discuss that further, uh, please feel free to contact me. This is Cameron. Um, and part of coordinated entry is looking at lowering barriers to shelter and housing programs, and that definitely includes emergency shelter. So if that's happening in your community, that is absolutely a conversation that we would encourage you to have um, when you are looking at implementing coordinated entry. Um, wanting to also let you all know quickly, I know we've told you all we have some trainings coming up with Org Code and Corporation for Supportive Housing. We are still waiting on some dates for those. With Corporation for Supportive Housing, we're going to be doing an intensive rapid rehousing workshop with all of our new um, and or existing, which was only one, rapid rehousing grantee. For um, our COC grantees, we're hoping to be able to include ESG in that training. That has not been confirmed, and I do not have a date for that one yet. We were hoping for mid-March, but seeing as it's the 8th of February and I haven't received confirmation, I don't think that's going to happen. We want to give you all plenty of time to get here for that and that one we will be doing in Austin just because our rapid rehousing projects are really spread out across our geography. The other trainings are the ones we've been talking about for a while with Org Code. Those are going to be two-day trainings. Uh, the first day is going to be um, how to make an awesome emergency shelter and day two is going to be housing stability. So anyone in your community working on housing uh, specifically housing case management and that's you know from shelter to permanent supportive housing. We're really excited to have Org Code coming down to do these trainings. We just nailed down the dates for our first um, training series and that's going to be the last week of March in Denton and either Abilene or Lubbock we're coming at you. You're probably going to hear or someone in your community is going to be hearing from Craig this week to start planning um, those trainings. And then in May, date to be determined, we are going to be in Galveston and Corpus. And how we determine these locations is really just, well, Craig, 
and Caitlin pulled out the map and mapped out all of our <laughs> grantees and then other service providers in our system. So our hope is that, you know, one of these will be convenient for you if it's not located in your city or county, and we're really hoping for a good turnout to these. Um, we're covering the cost for all of these trainings from Org Code, and HUD is covering the one for CSH. So we're looking forward to seeing you all at those, and as soon as we have the details, we'll be sending them out. Yes. And I guess I'd ask before we wrap up if anybody else has any questions for us today. not seeing anything pop up. Um, I think you all know how to get a hold of us. That wasn't a one-time offer. Um, please contact us with questions, comments, concerns, suggestions. If you um, want your community to be spotlighted, please get in touch with Mary. Uh, we're definitely wanting to hear about the great work you all are doing across the state. And I am going to wrap it up at that. We will see you all. Some of you, I know we have folks from Abilene going to NAH. We didn't get messages from anyone else. But if you're going to be there and would like to take advantage of that opportunity and meet with any of us, we would love to arrange that with you. Uh, Gulf Coast Center will be there. Great. Jason Murphy said he was going to be. That's the only one that I saw. All right. Um, and aside from that, our next webinar is going to be the 8th at 2 o'clock, same time, same place, and all of the information from today will be posted on our website. So thank you all. Have a great rest of the week, and we'll be in touch soon. Bye. Bye. Adios, y'all.